We go back through the best of our conversations from an NBA season for the Lakers we won't soon forget. This episode, we cover how it all started for the team and where it headed in part one of our Lakers Championship Rewind. Welcome to the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. This is Gerald Glassford. I've done shows on Pop Culture Cosmos and also Inside Sports Fantasy Football. You hear those every single week. I've got a love for the Lakers, so I'm here to talk so much about the team and their prospects going forward. And with me today is an outstanding guest. He is the host of the Unapologetically Me podcast. You got to check it out today on SoundCloud on the One A Week channel. That's right, the one, number one a week channel on SoundCloud. It's a good man indeed, and he's here as a fellow Lakers fan. Purple and gold, baby. It's Boomer Pearl. I appreciate you having me on, man. I'm doing good. I'm uh, I'm excited to get into this. I live on the East Coast, so there's not too many uh, people to talk Lakers with out here. Laker fans are everywhere. I've seen Lakers jerseys all over the world. China, Philippines, anywhere you go, there's Lakers fans always somewhere embedded in there. But is there any one particular player outside, of course, Anthony Davis and Mr. LeBron James, who are obviously the two marquee names and the two that have to stay healthy in order for the Lakers to get to that next level, to get into that championship mix, to get into the playoff hunt? Is there any one player that you point out exactly who needs to step up and become that number three if there's going to be a guy i don't think there's any question it's going to be kuzma you know i think the biggest thing that was keeping him the last year at least obviously consistency with the jump shot if he could just get that more consistent and just put a little more effort in on the defensive end because there's no reason a young athletic guy like that can't be a good defender he's an all-star so uh, i don't think there's any question that he As long as he just gets a little more consistent with that jump shot, he's that number three guy. It is my good friend, Mr. TJ Johnson. Just glad to have you on the show once again, my friend. What's up, buddy? Glad to be here once again. A couple of dry runs earlier, but I feel pretty good about this one. Absolutely. As do I, because you're sounding clear and everything sounds just great. Uh, You know, those internet bugs, those gremlins seem to be just like, okay, flick them off. All right, and now we're good to go, so it's awesome indeed. <laughs> but it's just so great to have you here. I wanted to ask you, the odds right now here in Vegas are very close as far as Anthony Davis or LeBron. In fact, they're either fifth or sixth. You flip-flop either of them, whichever the money line goes to. I mean, people seem to you know, like to one day like Anthony Davis to go ahead and they put money on him, so he put, goes ahead of LeBron. People love LeBron. They put money on him, so he goes ahead of AD. Right now, it's about fifth or sixth, about 10 to 1 odds for winning the MVP. And I think both have to have a great season in order for the Lakers to get where we're hoping that the team will get. Right. Uh, and, and they also have to be healthy, at least 70-plus games. Right. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, or else it's going to be really tough for the Lakers to make any headway in the Western Conference. So I ask you, my friend, you're coming to Vegas. You're flying in. You're going to go hit the hotels. You're going to go put maybe the Wynn, Venetian, Bellagio. <laughs> okay. And before all right. you put all that money down on any of the, the poker, the blackjack, or, or anything else out there, back rack or craps or anything out there, you're going to go ahead and put some money down for MVP. LeBron versus AD, your choice on that. I know you mentioned LeBron. He, does he have enough in the tank for one more great season? Or is all the talk from Anthony Davis that he's done this summer about the level he wants to play at be enough to get him into that MVP race. Ooh, yikes. You know, I was prepared for this question and then I wasn't. It's so sad. We've had the, we've had an opportunity to prepare for this question two or three times now. And I'm still, yes, we have still not quite ready, but here it goes. I think truth be told, if we're, if we're just talking between those two, then you'd almost have to go with LeBron in a weird way. Truthfully, I don't think either one of them, if we're talking the entirety of the NBA, I don't think either one of them. But if I have to pick between AD and LeBron, I'm going to pick LeBron, and here's why. Anthony Davis has made it very clear that he wants to be able to focus on defense, and he is in a position now to where he can. 
He doesn't have to be the offensive focal point. He doesn't have to be the guy on offense. He can spend more energy playing defense. And let's let's call a spade a spade. LeBron's best defensive days are behind him. He's not that same guy defensively. So Anthony Davis has already made it clear he wants to be a defensive player of the year candidate. He's also made it very clear that he wants to be, with LeBron, all-NBA defense first team. So those are very, very lofty goals, but they're also very exciting goals from the standpoint of, okay, now we're getting back to basketball. You know, there's a, there's, there's a lot to be said about this run-and-gun style offense that Golden State's made popular recently that was a, truthfully originated with the seven seconds or less Suns by Mike no D'Antoni and Steve Nash. But it's, it's nice to be able to hear the word defense with a superstar, and you know he means it. So that part is exciting, but because he's more going to – I feel like he's going to be more defensively orientated. I think that kind of takes him out of the MVP hunt. Just from a simple standpoint of typically MVPs go to teams who have an offensive player who is just a monster, you know, a Kawhi Leonard or Giannis Antetokounmpo type, James Harden type, who while they play defense, that's not really been the point. Everybody knows defense wins championships. That's that's no that's never been a, a hidden thing. I think thing. that's what won it for Toronto last year. I think their <laughs> Absolutely. defense – combined Absolutely. with, with Leonard and the rest of the team. I think that's what won it for them. Yep. And the fact that LeBron was out the East, but yes, the defense is what won it, but it's the offense that gets the glory. Uh, and that's just kind of what it is. Now to make the argument for LeBron, he's coming off a season where obviously it was very injury riddled. Missed the most time he's missed in his entire career off last season. And people are starting to, people are starting to write him off. People are starting to prepare for his eventual downfall. He's been playing at a superhuman level for so long. I mean, remember, he came into the league at 18 years of age, and he's now 34, will be 35 this year, and he's been playing at MVP status probably the last 9, 10 years of his career. I mean, he's legitimately been an MVP candidate for the last 10 years of his career. Every team that he's gone to as an immediate title contender, and every team that he leaves is an immediate bottom feeder. So that has to tell you how much he himself brings to a team which in my opinion would make him an MVP candidate every year which I don't understand why he's never in the conversation that's for another day with all that said because he's got this bit of an axe to grind as well I think that gives him a bit of an edge the flip side to that is now you have Anthony Davis in the hunt who yes has made it very clear he wants to be defensively orientated but I think as a young player in the league as a young man you still want touches. I mean, I hate to say if you go back to that 2012, 2013 team with Dwight Howard and Steve Nash, Dwight Howard made it very clear he wanted touches too. Now, granted, we're talking about a different a different person. We're talking about a different personality. We're talking about a different style of play with Dwight Howard versus Anthony Davis. But there's still that human factor of wanting to get some shots. So you're going to want to try to get Anthony Davis integrated into the system. You're going to want to try to get him integrated into the team. And LeBron James is well aware, well versed in the fact that he's not going to be able to play this game forever and that his time is coming. So he's going to want to get somebody ready to kind of take over that mantle of the handing the team over to somebody. He wanted to do that for Kyrie. It didn't quite work out like that in Cleveland, but he wanted to hand over the team to Kyrie. He wants to hand over the team to an Anthony Davis because that's who LeBron is. LeBron is by and large more worried about assists even if it means handing over the team, he's worried about the assist. He's not worried about making the the hero play. He wants to make the sacrifice. He wants to be the one to lay over the wire and let somebody else crawl over him. So it's really going to be interesting to see. There's an interesting dichotomy to that. You know, he's got this chip on his shoulder from last season, which justifiably so people are starting to write him off. But his natural game is more mandated to being a facilitator and being the guy that does it all versus just strictly purely offense. We've seen when he's been just purely offense and it hasn't always bode well for him. It equates to wins in a season, but it doesn't equate to uh, postseason uh, wins. So it's going to be tough, man. If I have to pick between those two, it's going to be LeBron. But truth be told, I hope neither one of them are really worried about an MVP. I hope they're both worried about just being great teammates, building up that chemistry as quickly as possible, and making sure that they have the right pieces in place to make a deep playoff run because that's really what it boils down to your 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 window of opportunity is closing rapidly i'm talking to darren levy what is their general outlook on this upcoming season laker fans in general are they're very critical and 
fairly well-educated bunch in terms of basketball acumen. True story, I was at the Bagel Nosh in Santa Monica the other day having some delicious smoked salmon, and there was these kids next to me. I don't think they were older than 10, 11 years old, and they were talking about you know, player efficiencies and, and over under ratings. And it's just, it's just mind blowing to see, you know, the range of Laker fans, young and old talk about like really intense, like statistics, player rosters and everything, you know, but when it comes to the readers on my site, I mean, they're, they're just a general makeup of the city, you know, just, you, you have, you know, people who are just extremely critical saying, you know, we may not even make the playoffs. And then you have obviously the true diehard Laker fans who are saying that we're going to win a championship this year. Well, the outlook is good. If LeBron and AD stay healthy, I mean, their chance right now in a wide open NBA because Golden State obviously has had major changes to their roster. And right now, Toronto has also had major changes to their roster as well. So with all that going on, there's now a chance for one team to go ahead and burst out of that pack from what we're talking about with most experts. I'm sure you've also investigated thoroughly as well with about what, six, maybe even seven teams in the West that can buy realistically for the top spot in the West and another two in the East, because pretty much everybody in the East has said or indicated. And from what I'm seeing as well, when I'm gauging that it's just down to Milwaukee and Philadelphia, so I ask you, my friend, thinking of all that in the context of what it is, I want to hear your thoughts on what 2019-2020 should look like for the Los Angeles Lakers, even with a very competitive Western Conference, even with what we see going on in the Eastern Conference, at least your thoughts on where things stand with the Lakers and where they will go from here. Yeah, well, you know, barring injuries, and of course that's always the major asterisk, Barring injuries, the Lakers should be in the top three in the West, you know, along with Denver, Clippers. I mean, even Portland, they're going to be legitimate, Utah Jazz. I mean, but I think the Lakers are going to be at least in the top three. And that's really all they they just need to get into the playoffs. Because once they're in the playoffs, LeBron's going to work his magic. And he is so hungry to get back and to make a statement after missing the first year after eight straight years in the playoffs. You know, and there's no other duo in the NBA right now that's going to be as strong as AD and LeBron, not even close when it comes to their size, strength, and their abilities, and, you know, obviously their experience. Again, the Clippers, you know, even though we're all Laker fans, you know, the Clippers, they're just immensely strong. They have Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams, Montres Harrell, and they have chemistry. I think those two teams are really going to be duking it out in the West. I think a lot of teams can buy for that Western Conference top spot. I think the Lakers are definitely in the mix. And you're right, it is based off of health with LeBron and AD. But when it comes to playoffs time, you and I both know it's all about matchups, 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 and who matches up better against who. And with AD and LeBron in a seven-game series, they're very hard to match up against. I mean, LeBron and AD are very smart on the ball, out there on the court, and they can go ahead and exploit weaknesses of other teams once they get used to seeing what they're seeing out of their opponents. So I hear you on that. And who is with me? Well, it's none other than the man behind Lakerholics for great insight on some fan opinions on all over the spectrum when it comes to Los Angeles Lakers. You got to check out Lakerholics.net today. It is a good man indeed. It is Laker Tom. And I'm, you know what, Tom? I'm just glad you came back and returned to the show. Well, it's a pleasure doing the last broadcast with you, Gerald. And uh, I'm looking forward to the day. So there's always something going on with the Lakers. That's for sure. But my friend, the Lakers are still in the Far East at this point in time. They actually did manage to pull the game off in Shanghai, despite all the controversy, despite all the advertisements going down, despite all the threats, all the tension, all the things that were created by the controversy that was started by Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey with just one tweet. That's Twitter for you. All these controversies always start with Twitter these days here in this decade. When we look back on history for this decade, it's going to say most of these controversies emanated from one tweet on Twitter. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I mean, it's so funny how this thing works out as far as one tweet caused all this international uproar, all this financial and 
potentially costly situation in regards to the NBA and China and all that. But the Lakers did manage to go ahead and play a game against the Brooklyn Nets. They didn't quite exactly win. Now, mind you, it's just an exhibition game. They didn't have the players in there at the end that you would normally think would be there. But still, there are some things we'll talk about that later on here coming up. But I first want to get your thoughts on the situation now with China. As we speak, this weekend, the Lakers will still be playing another game in the Far East against Brooklyn again. Your thoughts on the whole NBA-China situation and how it affects the Lakers? Because they're not talking to press. Everybody's been shut down right now. So all you can really get is like just a game. And then that's it. No ambiance, no extra, no any outside things right now because of all the tension that's been created by the NBA China controversy at this point in time. It's really an incredible situation. As I was telling you earlier before we got on the air, I generally don't allow the blog to get going too much on politics or religion. You know, we try to keep sports separated, especially from politics. This is a situation where I basically felt a little differently, and I allowed the blog pretty much to discuss it different ends. And, and uh, fortunately, everybody was pretty copacetic about it, and there, we didn't have any fist fights or anything, and no threats were thrown. But it's amazing how it all starts, like you said, with not even a tweet, just a retweet from Daryl Morey of uh, support for the Hong Kong protesters. Just a little background, that my father's Chinese, came from China when he's 11 years old, my mother... Uh, was a waitress in the Chinese restaurant that he had. So I grew up as a bicultural kid. And and then I spent about 20 years of my career, business career, manufacturing in Hong Kong and China. So I have a lot of friends both in China and in Hong Kong, as well as family in China. So I can understand, as, uh, as the owner of the Nets put out a great article, talking about the cultural differences and, and how you have to take those things in context when you're speaking on international situations like we have here. And For the NBA, I mean, 20% of the revenue comes from China. So when you start to factor that in and look at how it's going to affect the salary cap going forward and so forth, it's it's definitely an issue that has multiple layers. I think like any company trying to do business and trying to get access to the China market, the NBA has to be careful. Personally, I'm pleased with the end result of what David Silver has done. You mean Adam Silver? Adam Silver, yeah, I'm sorry. He's, he's really taken a, a stance where he's going to support the freedom of expression that the NBA players have always prided themselves in. Unlike the NFL, for example, that really seems to not want to have their players be individuals or their owners. Silver's come out very strong in that defense. And, and with the realization also that this could have some very extreme circumstances as far as the future of the league goes in entering that China market. So I just hope that everything goes along well and that maybe once the Lakers and the Nets get back home, that things will cool off a little bit and we won't have to have a 20% adjustment on the salary cap next year. That's going to make a strange free agency market in 2021 if we don't have China as part of the participation. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think all, you see all of the players now starting to be pretty careful about what they say, not wanting to you know affect their paychecks down the road and And it's a little bit of reality coming to boost on the whole idea that uh, we're a global market. There's been so many politicians, so many individuals out there, keyboard warriors or basically commenters, even from the president on down, they've all been saying things about the NBA and their stance in regards to what was said. And I don't envy Adam Silver one bit in regards to the job he's had to do over the past week. This reminds me of one of the first few weeks that he was in office and the Sterling fiasco that right. went, went awry and all that. And he handled that brilliantly. This time, the first statement that the league put out over the course of the weekend was too vague. And that really just inflamed things even more on one side or the other. And then you have the statement that he made when he was in Tokyo, just before he left to China. I think that was more profound. I think that was more in line of what they have to say because they do have to support one side, but they also have to try and support another because we're dealing with over a billion dollars, plus also shoe contracts, clothing contracts, business dealings, partnerships. I mean, it's easy for all these politicians and and other individuals that are not related to the NBA to say all these things and say, oh yeah, we should just abandon China. And people put bills into Congress as far as NBA, no longer do business in China and all that. But, okay, you walk away from that type of money, that type of revenue, 
it affects everything everywhere. Just because you cut all that off, like you said, salary cap issues also as well, just as an organization, and you're dependent for that for so long, and then all of a sudden you cut that off. Guess what? That's going to lead to layoffs all over the place, all over the world for that type of business. So people don't understand the ramifications of just cutting off basically what, uh, you know, a good 10, 20, 30 percent of your business right there. It's gone. And if you go ahead and say or do the wrong thing. So that's why the the league has to walk on eggshells. Same thing with Hollywood. As far as because I do the pop culture shows and all that, we talk so much about movies China has now become a very close number two market in the entire world. So if an actor or actress says the wrong thing or supports the wrong thing that China is not groovy with, they could literally just shut off all Hollywood movies. And there goes a substantial portion of the income. And that eventually could lead to jobs here in the States or around the world that are affected all by this. So it, it is a slippery slope you have to walk every time you talk about China or anything relating to those hot button issues that China is very sensitive about. Yeah, it's true. I think Silver's done a good job on it, and it'll be interesting to see what happens as we move forward. I think we're going to see all of the players and the executives in the league sort of, sort of tread carefully on the whole subject and not want to get involved in it. One of the things that was kind of disappointing was that and I got a lot of friends in China who made the same comments. In China, they released a statement that was in Chinese, but it wasn't the exact same statement. So they basically were almost saying that this was something that was done wrong by Maury's comments. And so then when he, they came out with a second set of comments, that was really a, sort of like a flip-flop situation. So talking about having to be careful and walking on eggs for this whole situation, hopefully we'll get through and we'll, the team can get back and then things will get back to normal. Absolutely, my friend. I hope so as well. And I, as I said on my pop culture show, I hope for a peaceful resolution to the issues going on in Hong Kong. I hope for no more tragedy, no more loss of life or anything of that nature. I'm hoping cooler heads will prevail in all this in regards to the NBA, China, Hong Kong, and all this stuff. And I'm hoping for a good resolution to this that will keep NBA and the product and the Lakers and eventually, yes, the return of the Houston Rockets back as far as an entity that China, all of China, that large market can watch because yes, it's dollars and all that, but it's also people that like us that just want to see the NBA, that just yeah. want to see these teams. And to prevent that from happening is something that would be very tragic for all parties concerned, both on the Chinese and also on the NBA side as well. This is Raphael from NBADraftJunkies.com. And you are listening to the Lakers Fast Break. Hey, Lakers fans. Looking for the best place to go for up-to-date news, information, original videos, articles, podcasts, opinion pieces, and discussions about the world champion, Los Angeles Lakers? Well, look no further than Lakerholics.com. With a legion of followers always there talking about everything Lakers and the NBA, there's no better place to go to share your fandom as the team heads toward another championship run. So stop by and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. He's back again just before the season starts. It's my good friend. He's a man among men when it comes to Lakerholics. You got to check out all the great thoughts on the Lakers, his thoughts in detail on Medium.com and also Lakerholics. It is Laker Tom. Laker Tom, we're not going to get 50% shooting from the three-point area every single game. That would be great. But I'll tell you what, if the Lakers can shoot like that, you know what? The sky's the limit, and a championship could be in sight for the Lakers team. I agree 100%, Gerald. Steph Curry was asked about the Lakers. And Steph said, well, boy, they're going to be a handful to handle he made the point that if you start off with LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and then you surround them with shooters and defenders, which is exactly what Rob Palenka has done, you've got a pretty good formula. And he thinks that the Lakers are going to be a handful for anybody to handle. You know, you go through the preseason, and preseason is, you, you watch the first quarter of the first preseason game, and you're excited, and then by the third quarter, you see that it's filled with scrubs trying to make their name on the team and coaches trying out new things and 
and and the games really almost turn into like preseason football games. Nobody you want to see in the starting lineup is playing. But I think that there were some things that came through. If you if you look at the preseason on a whole, that that game Wednesday night was really the exact thing that we were looking for, because we saw all of the elements. And when I say the Lakers were hitting on all cylinders, they really were. They shot sixty percent from the field, held the Warriors to thirty six percent, shot fifty percent from behind the arc, including taking thirty three point shots, held the Warriors to twenty one percent. They out rebounded them forty six to thirty four. And what was really surprising is they had 33 assists to 10 for the Warriors. Now, it would be wonderful to play the Warriors every game because they certainly aren't, at least at this point in time, with Clay Thompson injured and Kevin Durant departed and uh, a roster that's basically five or six players deep and then filled with just add-ons. The Warriors are going to have a difficult, difficult season, I think, this year. And uh, they're... They're a distant memory to the dynastic warriors that we were used to in the last five or six years. And that's going to open up the opportunities for the Lakers as well as the Clippers and the Rockets and the 76ers and, and the Bucks and all of those teams that now see their championship windows wide open just because of the, what's happened with the Warriors. But I'm excited about the Lakers. I think that I think we saw the power of having two superstars both of whom have something to prove and a chip on their shoulder right now in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Lakers fast break is the perfect title for this podcast because what we saw was a Magic Johnson clone being created in LeBron James. The way he was running up and down the court, there wasn't wasn't other guards bringing the ball up. It was Magic bringing the ball up every single time he was in the game. And several times he went all the way around straight down to the hoop a couple of times with that famous spin move of his that's almost unstoppable. A couple other times just just bully balling the way the defenders and going in for easy layups. LeBron looks like he's younger, stronger, quicker, faster than he has the last three or four years. And that, that long summer off is really going to be a blessing for him. Anthony Davis, this is a guy who had one average, two assists his first six years in the league. Last year, raised that up to four assists. He had sorry, eight assists. That's just an amazing performance because he was doing the assist every which way you could think of him. He was hitting guys who were cutting to the basket. He was hitting guys for lobs and dunks, and he was hitting three-point shooters that were wide open on the perimeter. I think so what you're seeing with the Lakers is, just like Steph said, you start with LeBron and AD, and you surround them with shooters and defenders, and it's going to be an awful hard season for teams wanting to take down the Lakers. I think that Vegas has us the favorites right now, and I think they're dead on. We're going to win it all this year. Hi, this is Mr. Holiday from the podcast, My Worst Holiday, and you're listening to the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. That's a great conversation each and every year when I talk to him, and whenever he gives us updates of what's going on in the NBA, it is a good man indeed. It is Anthony Barber, and Anthony, just great to have you back on the program. Yeah, it's great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Seeing that, how we laid it out, we both talked about the Lakers and the Clippers having those teams that match up well in a seven-game series. They're not exactly maybe the teams that are going to be geared for a top seed one or two in the Western Conference, but they're more aligned with probably trying to go ahead and move forward in the playoffs. I see both having a very long run of the playoffs, but I want to hear your thoughts on exactly who will come out in the Western Conference. In the Western Conference, I mean, I, I really think it boils down to as many games are, that will be won by some of these teams. As you look at the playoff experience and, and, and the way to set up for the playoffs, I only see a handful of teams, you know, in the Western Conference. And that's the Clippers and that's the Lakers. That's, I mean, those are two teams I really see in the Western Conference. Unless Denver, you know, one of those young players realizes some kind of potential ascended saying level and just pushes them over the top. I, I see it, you know, either the Lakers or the Clippers. If if the Lakers are healthy, I think that's the one question mark you have. You know, Anthony Davis, Dwight Howard, I'm not worried about LeBron, but those guys have been injured a lot of their careers and mostly of, of late. So, 
You know, Ow, I just nicked my finger. I'm out five games. <laughs> and then, I mean, with the Clippers, I mean, you know, Kawhi's had some trouble, Paul George, but I think, you know, they'll they'll manage them and they'll be ready for the playoffs. Their defense will be there. So I think those are the two teams that can really vie for the top spot in the West after the playoffs. And it's kind of a flip of, of the coin. So I'm going to go with the Clippers, not because I'm a Clipper fan, but because I don't know if I necessarily trust Anthony Davis to be healthy through the playoffs. I kind of feel like it, how I felt as much as I love the guy about Blake when he was with the Clippers is like, is he going to be healthy when the playoff time comes? Even if he makes it through the regular season, it always seemed like when the playoffs came, something would happen. And now you got to go games with either him not playing or him being limited. And I think that really takes from what you're able to do. So with that, I'm going to give the, the, the slight nod to the Clippers. But I do think both of those teams are very close in being able to chance to compete for a championship. I think in the playoffs, when it comes down to it, you're exactly right. It, it'll come down to the Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Clippers. And I know you don't say that out of favoritism per se, because you've been hard on the Clippers before in our past conversations. Let's put that out there. You've been very harsh on the Clippers before and the team you love. And it's always hard when you go ahead and criticize the team you love, because you know in your heart you want them to do so well. I And, and I do try to say this as best I can. But if they are healthy, I think the Lakers will go all the way as far as the Western Conference is concerned because of the fact that in a playoff series, if both the Lakers and the Clippers are healthy, the Lakers with that front line, I think is something that the Clippers, as of yet, barring an unexpected move, although that could change with a trade at the trade deadline, I think the front line of the Lakers is just a little bit too much. Uh, but again, if Anthony Davis, five games out, 10 games out. We've seen it before. You don't have very much confidence in that. I'm not exactly super 100% confident right now in that either. So I'm kind of concerned about that as well. But if they're both healthy enough, come playoff time, and you have your big two versus the big two, I think I'm going to go ahead and squeak the LA Lakers in a seven game series, which would be awesome for the city of Los Angeles, either which way the Clippers or the Lakers winning. It would just be truly awesome to see in a Western conference final, because I think they both match up better for the playoffs than any other teams in the Western conference. And I see the Lakers going ahead just by the narrow of a seven games, maybe just like a Kawhi shot in reverse <laughs> time, you know, as he walks off the court against Philadelphia It'll turn around maybe LeBron or AD doing the same thing to him at this point in time. But, you know, either which way, it's going to be a great series. I think Western Conference Finals with the Lakers do going ahead and advancing in the Western Conference Finals to the NBA Finals. So that comes to the NBA Finals. I got to hear your thoughts. Who you have, Milwaukee versus the Clippers. I have Philadelphia versus the Lakers. Where's Allen Iverson when you need him? But anyways... <laughs> Your thoughts on an NBA Finals between the Clippers and the Milwaukee Bucks. Who do you have? Between the Clippers and the Milwaukee Bucks, I would have to go with the Clippers. I think, like you said, the thing with Giannis is his lack of shooting allows you to play a certain style of defense against him and, and game plan against him, wall him off, and make other guys have to beat you. And then when you couple that with the perimeter defense that the Clippers are going to have with Patrick Beverly and Kawhi and Paul George, I think it'll, it'll be too much for Giannis by himself. I know they have Chris Middleton, but it, I don't think they have enough. Middleton has not proven himself in the playoffs. Middleton is not someone who has proven himself. And, and, and again, Middleton's not a guy who creates his own shot. You know, he's not that type of a player or creates for others. So um, I don't think he – in that regard, takes some of the, you know, he's able to take the pressure off of Giannis. I think Eric Bledsoe has that capability as far as handling the ball and, and, and driving, you know, drive kick game. But I just don't think they have, I, I'm, I'm always more partial to teams with multiple guys that can get you, that can win a game for you. And to me, Giannis is their guy to, that can win a game for them. But I think the Clippers have more guys that can win a game, that can go off for 30 in a game, or, you know, have a quarter where, you know, they just take over a game. 
And so I give them the nod. I, I think the Clippers would win it in six. The Clippers have multiple individuals that can take over a game, like you indicated, whether it's Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, or even Lou Williams, who can take over a quarter for a period of time as long as you don't ask him to play defense. Meanwhile, the rest of the team can play defense. Landry Shamit can go ahead and shoot from the outside. You have Montrez Harrell, who, if he can really get going on the pick-and-roll game, can do a nice job as well. So you have all those facets making them a quality team and a very good choice for your NBA champion. And yes, there is some favoritism between what you and I say as far as me for the Lakers, you for the Clippers, but we have over the years been hard on both organizations. So I think we can say with confidence that choice of yours is very astute. I think, yes, even though you are a huge Clippers fan, you can detach yourself enough to say, hey, I'm looking at this thing overall and I see the Clippers going all the way. So I definitely understand that. With Milwaukee, Another reason why I didn't put them in the finals was because I think that loss of Malcolm Brogdon will hurt them very much. I think he was their version of Fred Van Vliet, who is someone during the course of playoffs can hit you a number of threes over the course of time. He can get very hot because he's a very good shooter from deep. And I think not having him there in the lineup during a playoff crunch time is going to hurt Milwaukee overall. So I want to go ahead and talk about my NBA finals prediction right now. And that's going to be the Los Angeles Lakers. I think they're going to go ahead and that one-two punch of Anthony Davis and LeBron James is going to go ahead and overcome anything that the Philadelphia 76ers can throw at them. So I think at this point in time, the Los Angeles Lakers are my pick because provided they are healthy, and again, you've said it best, provided they are healthy, that's a big if. I think that if is going to be answered, I think they're both motivated to be healthy this year, especially with AD going on a contract year and LeBron on a redemption year. I think you have all these things aligned, and the Lakers are going to probably tweak the roster a couple times more just enough to go ahead and put it out on top. We'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. I see the potential for basically like another Netflix kind of paradigm shift where here comes this other major player. They have a ton of resources. Apple could change the way that entertainment is consumed. They say it's the only time this year that you'll have stars from each brand battling each other. And we know it's not going to be the case, but they like to say that and more power to them, I guess. Well, it's a big first step bringing all those superheroes together. There were definitely some parts of the movie that I that I really enjoyed. And then there were some parts that I thought just kind of fell short of expectation. Part of it has to be something to do with how it's being promoted. And this is a thing where audiences do not agree with critics. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse, every week on Apple Podcasts. And over a dozen of your favorite streaming and podcasting options. With me again, he is the man behind Lakerholics. You got to be a part of the conversation today. And boy, there's been a lot of conversation lately with the Lakers now on top at 14 and 2. But you got to check them out right away at Lakerholics. It is Tom Wong, but you know him better as Laker Tom. Laker Tom, always great to have you back on the show. And 14-2, and two, best record in the NBA. I wanted to talk to you first about an article that you put out there that you tweeted and that you retweeted and that you retweeted. <laughs> and as I'm seeing it now, it shows up seven straight times on your feed. But I know this might be a Twitter thing, but, you know, or you could have just loved that article so much. Hey, no problem. Self-love the article. I'm all for that. But it is a great article that you wrote on Frank Vogel himself, the head coach, about him being brought into the fray. He was actually like a fish into the frying pan because of the fact that he came in. He wasn't the Lakers' first choice. They hired his assistants for him, which also happened to have head coaching experience. And in, well, actually in one case, more head coaching experience than him. And you know what? He still managed to go ahead and take all that aside with a lot of people saying, hey, he's gone in 10 games. He's not going to stick with it. He's not going to be a part of the program. And you know what? He's not only been able to survive, but he's also been able to thrive. So I ask you, my friend, Frank Vogel, he's done a tremendous job so far, but I want to hear what impresses you most 
And especially out there, if you get a chance, read his article that you can go ahead and check out in Lakerholics via medium.com. But I want to hear your thoughts on Frank Vogel and why he's done so well with what has been given to him. It's a little bit of serendipity that the Lakers ended up with Frank Vogel, because as you said in in my article, I basically said I thought he was the third choice of the Lakers. I'm not sure he was even that. I mean, <laughs> publicly, he there might was a have lot been of people who wanted, who wanted Luke Walton to stay around. There were, was definitely some interest in Monty Williams, and, and everybody was surprised that Monty actually took the Suns' job while he was still in contention for the Lakers' job. And Tyrone Lue. Tyrone Lue, who uh, basically was almost, you could say, LeBron James' handpicked coach. And Ty Lue basically uh, wanted a five-year contract, and the Lakers wouldn't give him a five-year deal, so he walked. Now, Frank Vogel had been brought up in the discussions as, along with uh, Jason Kidd uh, as one of the two coaches that the Lakers wanted to have on the staff. But originally, they were looking at him as an assistant coach. My article is titled, What a Difference Coaching Makes. And I really think that, you know, I've said before in our previous podcast that there are four architects of the Lakers' resurgence. Basically, Rob Palenka for the great job he did in building the roster. Frank Bogle for the great job he's done in coaching the team and the two superstars, LeBron James and, and Anthony Davis for the way that they've participated in the building of the roster, you know, supporting the coach and, 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 and everything that goes with it. So you can't really separate out one of those four factors and say that they're the key to the whole thing working. But the things that I like about Bogle start with defense. When you compare Luke Walton, uh, Tyrone Lou, Monty Williams, Jason Kidd, or any of those players out there who were people out there who were candidates for the Lakers job, nobody had the, the resume or the defense first philosophy that Frank Vogel had. I'm a big believer that when you build teams and coaches and front offices, that it's really important to have everybody on the same page, have everybody have the same philosophies, the same pushing in the same direction. And with the job that Palinka did in bringing six former players who were all defensive NBA players on that roster, it seemed to me that the natural perfect fit for the coach of that team was Frank Vogel. Because you knew, regardless of anything else that he did on offense, anything he did with structuring the way that the practices were going to be run, anything he did in substituting during games, his focus was always going to be defense first. That's how he got his reputation in Indiana. And it basically, you know, he's evolved a little bit offensively, uh, adopting the three-point line, sort of appreciating the fact that defense, that offense has to start from the outside in rather than inside out, as it used to do with the Pacers. But he still believes in defense starts at the protecting the rim. And it's just been a sensational job to see what has happened with all of these defensive players. We knew going in that Anthony Davis was going to be one of the top defenders in the league. You knew that Danny Green still had that same defensive mojo that he's shown throughout his championship career. But then there was Avery Bradley and a lot of concerns because Bradley the last three or four years has not played good defense. He's been injured a lot. He's been put into the wrong situations on teams without strong rim protection, which then opens him up for getting beaten uh, by by playing aggressively on guys, so he was a he was a big question mark, and a lot of people thought it was a odd choice that Palinka would go after him. And then you've got the ultimate case of Dwight Howard. You know, here's a guy who you you everybody laughed when they first brought him aboard, or even talked about bringing him aboard. And I really was not a favor of it at, at the start, but after watching him a few games. You know, I predicted early in the season, we're not, I think on our first or second podcast, that he was going to be the wild card for the Lakers this season. Well, you take all of those pieces together and what do you have? You've got a terrific defense. So I think everything with Frank Vogel starts with the fact that he's the right fit. You've got a roster full of former all defensive players, the guy that's the best fit to really get the most out of those guys and get LeBron James back to playing the kind of defense he did in his early years before he started using defense as a way to rest for offense. Bogle gets an vote primarily because of his defense orientation. Tom, just great to have you back. And I could tell you're all smiles <laughs> when I see you right now. Yep. Well, you know, that was, that was one great week of basketball. 
We even got a little load management in there where LeBron and AD got a little bit of rest. Kept up our record of not losing two games in a row. And the way they did it was just so impressive. Last night's game was, you're absolutely right, was the cherry on top of the Anthony Davis, 20 of 29 for 50 points, four steals, one block shot. Dominated the game completely. Well, LeBron basically had a half night off because of being in foul trouble. Although LeBron came out and thought you could have thought it was Steph Curry out there firing three-point shots from deep. His step-back shot was just nailing it. Six out of eight from long distance, 31 points, 13 assists. It was just a fabulous performance by the Lakers all around. And the newest Lakers star uh, trying to vie for the number three spot, Alex Caruso, had a season-high 16 points, four assists, four rebounds. Fabulous defense all night long. You just can't say enough about this team. They are really rolling. They are really rolling indeed. So I see the Lakers in in just being in a perfect position at this point in time. I think they're going to go through December. They may lose a couple more games, but they're going to finish December with a good four or five game lead on the rest of the West. And and I think it'll be a streak home from that point in time. It's Gerald once again. Thanks for listening to part one of our Lakers Championship Rewind. From the tense moments in China to the early run in the season for the Lakers, our conversations hopefully brought all of that into perspective. If you want to catch the conversations in full, we list the episodes used for this program in the show notes, which you can check out now right here on the Lakers Fast Break channel. Part two will take us into a new year and some tough times for the team and society as a whole. And we'll have the best of those interviews in the coming weeks right here on the Lakers Fast Break Podcast.